Good afternoon, everybody. Apologies for being a little late, just coming off another meeting. I'll give everybody a couple more minutes to, to trickle their way in. Hey Tom, uh, I saw your your chat. So we're trying a more uh, a slightly more formal format uh, in in terms of webinars. So um, in in terms of uh, asking a question and turning on video capabilities. Actually, I'm not sure about the video, but at least for the voice capabilities, just raise your hand and then um, Rukia, who's a moderator, will um, will open up access and also we'll still have the chat open as well. Good afternoon, Dr. Wu, Debashish, Ethan, Francis. Good to see you, Jim, Dr. Berryman. Hey, Yosh. Always good to have you, Lee. Pratik, uh, Dr. Hankins, Tiana, and Tom. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I know that I can't believe with Thanksgiving next week already. Um, I'm sure people's uh, schedules are a little tighter than normal. Though hopefully uh, no one's planning anything too crazy and too large. Um, I think none of us are going to do that. We're all very responsible. Um, so going ahead with our uh, national snapshot. Once again, we started last week Thursday breaking the six, uh, six digits figure and unfortunately again continue to rise. Uh, unclear whether or not you know we're at the peak or we're still climbing. That remains to be seen, unfortunately, with uh, this uh, with December still coming around the corner and uh, Christmas and, and New Year's. So, and uh, ho hoping for the best, um, but and for a more uh, unified response at the federal level, but it was still yet to be seen. Uh, in terms of uh, our local snapshot, this is these are numbers from last week. So, as you can tell, uh, for this past week we uh, decreased, which is great. Um, we are now below triple digits for our seven day average, 88.3. Uh, this was pulled yesterday, so our new cases yesterday was 71, today we're at 103, so back up to the triple digits. But um, uh, we're, we're still adjusting to the two day lag in the reporting. So uh, still remains to see uh, what that's gonna have on uh, our capabilities as well for forecasting. Our seven day average cases, uh, once again, 100 to, to 93, uh, 70 average new deaths, apologies, I should actually say uh, 80, what, what is it? 88.3, apologies. Um, seven average day new deaths, so once again, fatalities, zero, um, our onesies and twosies. Uh, all, every life is obviously a, a tragedy, loss of life, but it's good that we are uh, a very good a trend, which is flat and we're at zero. Hospitalization, slight increase, but once again, uh, not nothing uh, too alarming for the hospitalization. Uh, we'll still keep an eye on that, uh, if, especially if our case numbers start to increase again. And, and our ICU hospitalizations are, are also very flat, which is once again very, very good news as we head into the holiday season for Hawaii. Percent positivity for the state continues to hold steady around 2%. Uh, once again, I know uh, with, with our Safe Travelers program, we're going to uh, see what the impact is. And then for our, our 24 hour or higher testing turnaround, we are still holding steady, uh, set increase from last week. But if you focus on the overall volume of tests, we have slightly increased uh, trending up for the total volume of tests for 
uh, the past two or three weeks. Once again, this is a lag of a week for this particular metric. But volume-wise, we're still turning around the same around the same number of tests, about 22, 23,000 within 24 hours, which is good news. Our, our, looking at the national trends, uh, unfortunately, all three states, Texas, Arizona, California, are still trending up. Uh, and unfortunately, no, no sign uh, of stopping in sight, though Texas is going slightly downward, which is great news. Uh, and for Japan's trend, once again, keeping an eye out on, on what they're looking at. So uh, last week was the first time in a while they broke uh, the 1,070 case average number, and they are also continuing to trend up. Uh, once again, uh, still keeping an eye on it. We do have you know these safeguards in place with that trans-Pacific test strategy, and I know the governor just had a press conference today uh, tightening those regulations to ensure that if you don't have a result before you board the plane. Uh, even if you have that negative result when you land, uh, you still have to quarantine for 14 days. So that's another uh, safeguard that uh, was in place starting today. And Levi, I will hand off to you to brief uh, this slide. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, okay, so we have been trending uh, relatively flat. You know, really for the past couple of weeks, we've been fluttering around that triple digit 100 mark. Uh, so we are still projecting ar ar around that flat curve. Again, you know, on the pessimistic scenario, we, uh, we are projecting a little bit of a rise. Um, but what I also did was include uh, forecasts from other modelers across the nation that are all reporting to the CDC. So that's what those gray lines represent on the seven day average daily cases and the total deaths. Um, I, I put this in because uh, I wanted to show kind of the uncertainty around where we are right now. There's a lot that are projecting way up, way down. So, so we're, we're trying to kind of, we're, we're somewhere right in the middle of that. Uh, so again, we're going to be watching this really closely. And while the numbers are, I, 100 is not a small amount. Uh, but when it comes to the hospital beds and the ICUs, we are at a much lower number, especially compared to where we were. So it's difficult to, again, once we're this low, uh, really be projecting uh, accurately for the hospital beds and ICU. So while it, are, it is trending an increase, it really depends on what the clusters look like uh, and what the age uh, demographic makeup is of, of, of the clusters themselves. So um, we're, we're, we're really looking at the, the seven-day the, no, seven average for the daily cases. The hospital beds and ICUs uh, is a little bit tougher to, to, to predict just given um, uh, some of the unknowns around the clustering. But right now we're projecting around flat to slightly up for each of the metrics. Perfect, thanks so much Levi. And we'll, uh, we'll field questions um, after the end of the first section. And, and please, uh, if you have questions, just raise your hand and Adrian just posted uh, um, a quick reminder as well. So the next four slides, apologies for the, the, the blur, we're still working out. Um, you know, the, the graphics for this. Uh, but basically, uh, the intent of the next four slides is, is uh, scenarios um, and forecasting from one of our other HIPAM core members, uh, Dr. Shiba, who's unable to be on today. So I'm going to brief her slides today. So this slide is looking, uh, if nothing changes in terms of uh, no increase in arrivals uh, and everybody still is mass compliant, uh, no super spreaders, obviously, uh, everybody stays home for Thanksgiving. That's what our trend is going to look like, pretty flat. This next scenario is if we see uh, a, a slight, uh, a decent per drop in mass compliance of about at least 10%, um, and that's that teal line. So you're going to see a, a slight bump because mass compliance does impact uh, transmission of cases. Once again, we know that there's a lot more nuance in terms of wearing masks, really, we have good compliance outside. It's really the indoor mask compliance where we really have uh, very uh, little visibility on. Uh, and that's really where we see a large number of our community spread is indoors with, uh, with friends and family who are not uh, living with together, but do get together for these uh, small gatherings and that's where we see transmission. So once again, you have a slight peak but we'll, we'll again level off once again, keep in mind that these scenarios are uh, in of itself separate. So this is if holding everything else status quo, we see a 10% decrease or so of mass compliance. This, this third scenario is assuming we, we see a bump in uh, travelers and that's the, the major change is about one and a half times the, the volume of travelers that we're currently seeing. 
and you can see that while the trajectory is slightly increasing now, um, the major difference is in the absolute difference of, of cases, just because uh, you're introducing more people to, to the islands, whether it be their returning residents or, uh, or tourists. Once again, holding everything else constant. Finally, uh, you have, we have three scenarios that red is once again, uh, what we would expect to see if everything stayed the same with no super spreaders uh, and, and mass compliance, et cetera. And then you have that teal line from increase in travel volume. And then finally, this, the, this, this green line is if uh, we hold everything else constant, but we see an increased rate in transmission, that RT, that rate of transmission value, where we just see a slight increase in that, um, due to gatherings. And once again, it's, it's really hard to pinpoint increase in RT due to any one factor. It's really a whole host of factors like super spreaders and gatherings and mass compliance. But assuming we see an increase in that um, in transmission, that's, that's our trajectory. So uh, once again, it, it's showing three uh, scenarios that we hopefully will, would like to avoid in terms of the green and the teal. Teal, we have slightly less uh, control over in terms of travel volume but we do have control over our, our individual behaviors and education and messaging. So uh, those are the, uh, the scenarios based on uh, the, the trends that we've seen in the past week or so updated from, from Monique's uh, team. So Dr. Hankins, uh, I don't have the actual RT value for you right now, um, Dr. Sheba. Uh, send those slides to me pretty last minute. I can get you that information um, and, I'll, and I'll send it out to uh, the HIPAM uh, listserv um, and I'll send make sure that you get the information. Um, the, the, the great thing, once again, this is a perfect uh, example of the, the strength of HIPAM is uh, while we have Levi and myself on, on the, the HIPAM model, we also uh, utilize a lot of our partners, you know, Itzvan, uh, Monique in terms of their models. Um, and, and we have, we focus on slightly different things, scenarios versus forecasts, and we utilize slightly different methodologies, but, but that's, that's the strength of HIPAM. So I will make sure that we get um, that specific RT value or the beta value um, and share it with the group. Thanks for that question, Steve. Um, so the, the signs highlight uh, two, two, I mean, there were so many to choose from. Uh, thanks, Pratik. Um, uh, there's so many to choose from this week. There, there's a lot of exciting news uh, that came out this past week, but I wanted to focus on two. Um, obviously, the, the second one uh, everybody should have been tracking uh, has been on every major news outlet. Uh, but the first one, uh, what I thought was very interesting for, for potential future use. So assessment of SARS-CoV-2 RNA test results among patients who recovered from COVID-19 with prior negative results. So this was a research letter submitted to JAMA. Um, and basically, they were following uh, recovered patients. So in their study, they studied 176 recovered patients from COVID. Um, and then, you know, they studied them after they were discontinued from isolation, uh, showing no fever for three days and two negative RT-PCR tests, 24 hours apart, which is the clinical definition of a negative uh, of recovered COVID patients. Of those 176, 32 or 18.2% tested positive again with another RT-PCR test. Um, however, only one of those 32 or only 3% of those 32 had replicative COVID-19 RNA. So once again, I know, uh, I'm not sure if we have Marguerite today. Oh, we do. So we have experts in the house um, uh, for, for, for bio and microbiome. Um, but, but my takeaway was that while uh, th this adds to what we know about recovery time, viral load replication, and it potentially impacts epi assumptions in terms of you know, we have, and I'm going to go over a brief overview of, of COVID and, and um, incubation periods, et cetera. But um, it, we're starting to learn more and more about post COVID positive tests and timing. And so, uh, really, even with, with our PCR test still being the gold standard, and we're, we're, we're trying to get confirmation of a negative PCR test, um, maybe that might not be the way to go for specific situations and, and, and uh, those situations are too numerous to, to highlight, but this, this does highlight a diff, uh, an importance for understanding PCR versus antigen versus antibody, which I will which I will briefly go over uh, this afternoon. Our second highlight, uh, our science highlight, I think everybody uh, who has a smartphone or reads the news uh, is aware that Pfizer uh, 
put out their vaccine efficacy results, 95%, which is comparable to Moderna's RNA, 94.5%. Um, per Dr. Michael Osterholm, who's the director of Minnesota University of Minnesota SIDRAP, or Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, uh, the number one challenge now is really not in the research and development, it's really how to convert the vaccine itself into vaccination. And uh, I'm grateful that Dr. Wu is gonna speak a little later today about uh, vaccine logistics and efforts within the state of Hawaii. Uh, some information for everybody to be aware of, uh, regardless of it's Moderna or Pfizer's vaccine, uh, everybody who receives it will need two doses, the initial and then a booster one month later. Uh, currently, uh, per Dr. Collins, from, who's the director of NIH, there's about 40 million doses for distribution um, in December, um, which means that about 20 million will get initially and it will be based on risk. Uh, let me just see if Andrew Abe uh, shucks. I was hoping Andrew was on to, to answer a potential question. So with that, um, let me see if there's any other questions. So uh, Francis's question, does the current daily count of 70 average include visitors who turned up and found to have positive results for COVID-19 tests? That's a really great question, Francis. Um, Levi, do you have that answer? I would have to, to look back at um, the methodology for DOH off the top of my head. I can't. I, I, I can't do answer. not have that answer, unfortunately. Francis, well, we, uh, we can dig into that. What I can say is the numbers that we get are from, you know, straight from DOH. And so uh, if there's anybody from DOH who, who wants to respond, if not, we can, we can dig into that and look at the methodology and then get back to you, Francis. Um, I, can, I can answer that, oh, Tom. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks so, um, much. so, so the statewide seven-day averages in cases do not include non-residents who, who have a test done elsewhere for which they get the results, they receive the results when they're here in the state because those results are only um, are sent to the state of residence uh, or the state where the test was performed. And there's no systematic way for another state to identify that one of their cases happens to be on vacation in Hawaii. Um, if you look at the County of Kauai website, because we've identified a number of those that makes a difference in our numbers, uh, we are including them in our reporting and informally we are doing a side uh, calculation of the tiers and we do plan to include that but statewide it's not because there isn't a consistent way for us to get that information statewide thanks thanks so much janet um and we do have another question uh about hawaii vaccine de uh, deployment plan and i believe I, I i took a sneak peek at dr wu's slides. I believe he's uh, going to mention that um, in, in his presentation. And if not, then that's a great, uh, great future topic for, for, for our Thursday meetings. So I'm not going to take too much time, hopefully only about 10 minutes, because I'm going to leave Dr. Wu with a good 15 uh, minutes for, for his slides and then 15 minutes for Q&A. But I figured uh, with, with our new format and we're growing our, our, our audience and our viewership participants, um, I figured this would this would be a good chance. This, you know, we got into COVID for Hawaii March, April, um, and it's close to November. You know, it is November, close to December, so it's about five to six months. Um, and, and there's been some updates, but I, I feel like it's always good to have a refresher. You know, as as a professor, to to refresh some of the major uh, things about COVID transmission, et cetera. And and I'm only going to take a few minutes to go over this. So once again, it's an envelope virus, which means it's actually uh, a little easier to kill, a simple hand and soap will, will, will kill the virus a, a, as well as Clorox, et cetera. So that's a good thing. Um, genetically similar to MERS and SARS um, and infects cells similarly to other viruses. I'm not gonna get too much into this because this is not my area of expertise. In terms of transmission, we know there are three major modes, droplet, aerosolized, and fomite. So if you look at this image, I think this breaks it down really clearly uh, the droplet is is those red where it's gonna that's why we have that six foot distancing rule where anything that's um, in, in, within a, a droplet form uh, is going to drop to the ground um, within six feet and then you have the aerosolized transmission which is indicated by those uh, the black and yellow dots that those are when it's uh, in a much smaller size form and you see a lot more of that in drier 
uh, cooler environments. Um, and so that's one of the, the biggest benefits of living in Hawaii. We're always in a hotter environment. Um, it's, it's always humid here. So we're not worrying as much, at least outdoors, in terms of aerosolized transmission. Uh, we have seen documented by CDC uh, MMWR reports uh, of, of cases being trans, uh, of COVID cases um, due to aerosolized transmission indoors due to faulty AC symptoms where there is no uh, circulation um, from outside air into their units. They're just recirculating um, indoor air. And if they have a COVID positive case who's, who's coughing and not wearing a mask, it, we've seen it where it's, got, where it's uh, infected others uh, depending on the airflow uh, of the AC unit in, in, the, in, the, in the restaurant. And then finally, fomite is just touching. Uh, we do know that um, from, from the very controlled uh, studies, uh, it does prefer metallic surfaces, which are smooth, um, less likely to survive long periods in cloth um, and in jagged uh, and rough surfaces, uh, which is why we still promote hand washing and, and really not touching your face. So some major epi terms we're gonna go over I'm not going to get too nitty gritty. And then if you refer to our, our hypam.org website, we, we do go over some of the major terms as well. So, you know, you, we've heard, we've all heard these terms, uh, incubation period, latency, infectious period, clinical. And, and I think a lot of times they get interchanged. And when there's some very strict and clear uh, definitions when it comes to the epi. So uh, looking at the arrow, that's the point of initial infection. And then this green area, this green arrow is a latency period where the virus is replicating um, within you. You're not infectious yet. You're not showing clinical signs and you're not transmitting the virus. That's just the, the period where the virus is, is growing in you. And then uh, you have uh, the subclinical uh, period where you're still not showing clinical signs, but you are infectious. And that's where you see that overlap with the infectious period, which is that red period. And you notice that the subclinical infectious period also overlaps with the incubation period. So incubation period we know is about five days on average, which includes the latency period, the time in which uh, you from infection to uh, the subclinical infectious period. And then the last part of incubation period is when you are still not showing symptoms, but you are infectious, which means you can start to transmit the disease. And finally, you, you transition to the clinical period where you're now showing clinical signs. We do know that there's a good proportion of COVID positives who never show, uh, who never show clinical signs, whether or not they're, um, uh, they're asymptomatic, so that's a, that's a fancy word for saying uh, never showing clinical signs, or they're so mildly symptomatic that they themselves don't even realize that they're infectious and symptomatic. And they recovered. Um, you know, uh, in that JAMA article, I believe, you know, to, to be considered medically recovered, you have to uh, have two negative RT-PCR tests 24 hours apart and, and free of COVID without meds for three consecutive days. And then I went through uh, this. We're still, once again, we have uh, decent estimates, which really inform some of our major baseline assumptions uh, for the, the forecasting and scenarioing for the compartmentalized modeling. But once again, um, there's always exceptions to the rules. So uh, even some of these numbers, they're not super hard and fast. Gonna briefly touch upon testing. Uh, so, so I think this really does a good job of illustrating uh, the complexities in terms of the RT-PCR test, right? So when we think about PCR tests, we think, you know, are you positive or are you negative? When in fact, it's, it's a lot more nuanced than that. You know, you're looking for replication cycles and replication times, and, and there's, there's not, and you have a threshold, and, and it's really um, more of a, an art and a science than it, than it is like a, a black and white measure of a viral load when it comes to determining uh, whether or not someone is positive or negative uh, based on the RT-PCR test for, for COVID. And once again, I'll defer to, to Mark Green and our, our biologists and microbiologists in our group uh, if they want to add anything after this, this presentation. Uh, we know that the PCR test currently is the gold standard. Uh, there are 224 approved FDA uh, emergency use agreement or EUAs uh, for PCR. One thing that's been brought up more recently is whether or not it's too sensitive in terms of using it for other scenarios besides a clinical diagnostic setting. 
Uh, we do have more rapid PCR tests to reduce turnaround time. And I think there was news yesterday on CNN that I saw for potential home test kits while um, potentially having impact, though that really depends on um, the dissemination of those tests and, and the, uh, the logistics of that. Antigen testing is another type of, uh, of COVID test um, that has been deployed, though not quite as uh, voluminous as the PCR test. There are only 58 compared to that 220 or so for the PCR test. Um, it's much faster turnaround time. However, based on the information that we've gathered so far from studies, there's a much higher chance of false negative test results compared to the RT-PCR, about 20%. And then false negative means that the test tells you that you're negative when you're in fact uh, positive. And you can imagine the uh, impact that can have uh, utilizing the uh, antigen test. And then finally, the antibody test, uh, there's, it's still not really widely used, at least in a screening setting uh, or in a clinical setting. Really what, what uh, the antibody test uh, tells you, and, and I'm not going to get too crazy, I'm not teaching an epi class here, um, but what the antibody test tells you is meant to tell you is whether or not you've had COVID and recovered from it, and, and it detects the antibody levels for that. So, um, that these, the, the slide deck will be up on hotpan.org, but some, some major terms that you'll hear when it comes to testing, um, especially when we get closer to antibody tests and antigen tests, sensitivity and specificity. Sensitiv sensitivity is the ability to accurately identify uh, people who are truly positive as positive, and specificity is the ability to accurately identify our true negatives as truly negatives. So um, if you look on this square, let me see if I can use my pointer. So these are our true positives, these are true negatives, and then um, our false positives. So those who are screened positive, um, uh, but who are, sorry, this should actually say, uh, no, yeah. So those who um, screen positive, but who are truly negative, and then our false negatives, those who screen negative, but are truly positive. And the reason why I'm, I'm spending a little time focusing on this is because this ties into understanding uh, which test uh, you're getting and, and the application. So if you're getting a PCR test or an antigen test, you would, at least for your own personal health, you would rather be a false positive in terms of you're, you're positive, the test tells you're positive, but you're truly negative for that test. Versus if you're a false negative, um, that means that you're told you're negative, you screen negative with that PCR or the antigen test, when in fact you're truly positive. And that's, that's the result that we're, we really wanna avoid. Now for the antibody test, um, if you're a false positive, that means you've had COVID and you're, at least depending on that period of time, uh, you're theoretically not going to get COVID again and you're not going to transmit it. Versus a false negative, um, you've, you've uh, tested negative for the antibodies when you're actually positive uh, for, for, for COVID. So once again, there's a big difference in understanding these terminologies as it applies to the, uh, the different type of tests. So once again, um, there's a, we can spend uh, many more sessions just on testing impacts, but I just want to refresh on, on the test. Um, quarantine isolation, DOH, uh, I checked their Twitter. They did a great job describing the difference. And once again, uh, there is a difference. It's not just semantics. Quarantine is for people who are exposed or suspected of COVID, uh, but not yet confirmed versus isolation is for those who are truly 100% confirmed with COVID. Uh, based on what we understand, we know age, population density, um, having other comorbidities, your occupation and um, ethnicity are our major risk factors, though some of them are, are tied directly to socioeconomic status um, and, and other public health factors. Um, and gender, I think males are slightly higher based on initial results, though that might have changed uh, more recently. Prevention, uh, we're, we're, we're really big on public health, right? So wearing a mask, physically distancing, Washing your hands, exercise is really good. You know, you need to make a, a keep keep up your physical exercise, stay healthy. It's good for your mental health. Also uh, prevents uh, overweight diabetes because we know those are also uh, adverse comorbidities. Having a healthy diet ties into everything above, and any other, any other way to reduce risk is 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 obviously a great great way for uh, preventative measures. And then uh, wanted to highlight some other. Uh, food for thought from a high PEM experts, um, you know, it's fan, it's fun and Monique and Marguerite, all of us really, we really uh, uh, can't emphasize enough the, the role of super spreaders. Um, I know it's fun could, could 
could spend a lot of time really giving great detail lecture on super spreaders uh, and also on ventilation. There's been so much focus on mask wearing, which is great, but there's also an importance on ventilation, especially in Hawaii where we have really great outdoor capabilities uh, for our dining and, and other businesses. And then there's a lot of us focus on mental health impacts. You know, I know uh, Victoria, Dr. Fan, myself, we also look at mental health substance use impacts due to the longer term impacts of COVID. Vaccine logistics, uh, uh, Dr. Abe, Andrew Abe, and Dr. Wu, and a bunch of uh, others who are tied into the, 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 the local scene for vaccine logistics. And then um, I think everybody is aware of the, the non-binary relationship between economy and health, especially in Hawaii. And then finally, finally the, uh, we're, we're hoping to expand on messaging. Uh, the way it's messaged, how it's messaged is important um, for, for, for us within HIPAM and also for the state. So some worthy food for thought that we hope to expand upon on our Thursday uh, webinar series. And, and with that, um, I don't see any questions. So I want to uh, hand the floor over to Dr. Wu. Uh, Brian, if, uh, it's, it's, it's your, your floor. Is my microphone working? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You're good to go. Okay, perfect. Um, so someone's just going to advance the slides then? Yeah, I got it. Just let me know and I'll be your banner. I appreciate it. So um, just to preface this talk, um, I'm a PEDS pulmonologist. I I'm not a vaccine immunologist. So um, for anyone with additional expertise, please forgive me for butchering some of the basics about vaccinations. Um, so um, this is just a, um, a, a slide um, from the previous um, slide of um, how, how art can help in public health messaging. Um, um, found that interesting. I was hoping it would be less gloomy though. Um, so um, yeah, I apologize. I don't know why the font is so small, but um, you know, as folks are aware, um, you know, there's something called Operation Warp Speed, which is from our federal government, headed by CDC. The vaccine portion of it is where our federal government has, you know, financially supported, um, you know, various vaccine um, manufacturers and helping to create a COVID vaccine. And I believe um, seven have um, been contracted with for them to provision a certain amount of them. So um, the goal is that all, um, uh, everyone in America will have access to free vaccination. Um, so a lot of folks do have some concerns about vaccinations because they're wondering, wow, this is so fast. Um, I think the mumps vaccine was the fastest one developed and I believe it was four to five years. So we're talking about vaccine development markedly faster than that. Um, but you know, we do have a, a couple of um, advantages um, which may hopefully allay some concerns about vaccine development for COVID. You know, one is, as Thomas mentioned, um, there are similarities for um, SARS-CoV-2, AKA the virus that causes COVID, and SARS-CoV, the OG original, which caused SARS. So they were trying to make SARS vaccines. So there's a lot of head start in work manufacturing vaccines. You know, the, the target for a lot of the vaccines is that white protein. So in Thomas's previous slide, he showed this kind of med medical illustration of the virus with these little red things. Those are kind of the little spike proteins, which kind of helps the virus bind onto uh, a human cell. Um, so there's head start in working on it. And the other thing is, um, I think if you push click, another picture should appear. Oh, perfect. Um, there's more, um, quote, cutting edge approaches to vaccine development. So I'm just going to do a couple of quick slides about the various types of methods where vaccines can be developed. So on this current slide, and if anyone's interested, oh, I think I'll this. Um, the, the links on there um, um, give um, that nature one is a pretty helpful one to kind of explain vaccines to the general public. So um, inactivated vaccines, that's kind of like the flu, where you've used some type of a method to make the virus non-infectious and then you inject somebody with this. And then the person you inject, their immune system will kind of um, engulf this virus and then um, kind of develop an immune response to it. So it's kind of tricking your body. That's what vaccines do basically. They're kind of tricking your body that you have the infection so you can develop an immune response 
um, in case you actually get the infection. So um, inactivated viruses, weakened viruses is one method. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another method, um, this hasn't, uh, so um, viral vector vaccines, which is basically where um, you get a, a virus um, and then you put into their, the virus's gene um, a different virus. So for example, um, you have like a, um, like a, 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 a Ebola of, a vaccine or you have like a, a, a different type of a virus you put into this virus, uh, there, um, a gene that will make an Ebola virus part, then you inject somebody with this, that virus replicates, infects their body, and then their body will start um, developing an immune response to not only the virus you're injecting them with, but this piece of this other virus gene you've, you've inserted into it. Um, so that's an example. Um, so we've actually used this method to actually give medications. So we have actually um, done gene therapy where you put certain viruses and you insert uh, a protein that like somebody can't make. They have like a innate um, inability to make that protein. You put that protein in virus, inject them, they start making the protein to kind of help their underlying condition. So kind of interesting. Um, so some companies like um, Johnson & Johnson are kind of working on this type of strategy. Um, next slide. So another is a protein-based vaccine where you're basically making a protein. So in this case, like a spike protein of the coronavirus, you make it outside the body and then you inject them with it. So um, then the body sees this protein and develops an immune response to it. Um, and then something similar is a virus-like particles where you kind of um, make like the COVID virus, except you empty it out so it can't really replicate. So you're just making their outer shell and injecting people with it. Next slide. And then the more, more interesting one. So these are the two that are kind of coming out. So the Pfizer one and the Moderna one, these are using mRNA. So um, basically if you click again, another picture should show up. So um, basically what this is, is um, and I apologize if everyone's completely aware of this. So um, your DNA, if you think about it like a cookbook, and then um, a mRNA is like a recipe in that cookbook. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to create the mRNA outside their body, and then you inject it into their body, and the mRNA then gets um, into your cell. They kind of create this way for the mRNA to get into a human cell, so you inject it into them. And what it's doing is it's using your own body's um, kitchen um, so if you think of like the things that will read the recipe and create the, the, um, the food, so ribosomes, like think about it like a chef and all these different parts of the cells, is using your body, your cells own manufacturing system to create that piece of the virus. And the benefit of this compared to the other methods I talked to you about is um, it's pretty cost effective to do it this way and you can ramp up manufacturing quickly and you can really specify what you're injecting the body into. Because let's say you injected a, a, a virus um, with, and then you put um, a gene into it. Well, your body may kill the virus before it has time for your, your cells to, to read it. Um, so the mRNA, what you can do is you can um, create less potential, you can create more success for it to go into your body. And you can actually, be a little bit more aware of what kind of um, immune reactions you will have to it. Because if you're injecting like inactivated virus into somebody, um, they can develop a reaction to it. Um, but the hard thing about mRNA and DNA is we've never made vaccines this way. So it sounds theoretically good, but we don't have experience in it. Um, next slide, please. So that was my attempt to um, kind of do a little 101 about vaccines, but that article probably explains it much better than I. So regarding kind of um, the um, Hawaii's efforts in our COVID vaccination planning, and I know um, Dr. Hankins is on a call, so please feel free to, um, to jump in if I um, continue to butcher any information. Um, but, um, you know, one big question folks have is, well, um, 
you know, what are all the logistics into it? How are we prioritizing who gets it? Um, so this information and this link here is publicly available. So um, I think it was a month ago, somewhere around there, where every jurisdiction had to submit to the CDC their plans on how their state's going to roll out vaccinations. Um, so this is publicly available as executive summary, and it kind of um, provides a summary of um, how our state is going about planning this. And this actually comes from the National Academies of Medicine. So stage 1A, because um, I think as Thomas alluded to earlier, um, or somebody alluded to earlier, we're not planning on getting enough vaccines to cover our entire population. So we have to kind of prioritize it. Um, so in stage 1A is, um, you know, prioritizing the high risk health workers who have high risk of exposure and they're also necessary to kind of maintain our health system to help those that do get sick. Um, so first responders, high risk, high risk health workers um, is in that stage. Stage 1B are those that are the population who's really high risk for developing severe, you know, uh, complications if they were to get the illness. And then you can kind of look at the staging further on. But the logistical things is even within stage 1A, we may not anticipate, especially in the first go around of getting even enough virus to cover all of stage 1A potentially. We don't really know what's going to be out there. So there are a lot of um, active work looking at prioritization even more specifics. Um, and if you go to the next slide, and I'll pause if anybody's having any questions, but I think I have my chat box open. But if not, we can skip to the next slide. Uh, and actually, maybe you skip to the next slide and my thing is did, did, did I go to, uh, sorry, sorry, Brian, I, I didn't get a chance to oh. uh, upload your, your new oh, PowerPoint. No. Did oh, you no, want me to my go back? When my, yeah, if you could, sorry, when my um, monitor blanks out, my um, Zoom freezes. So I didn't know if you're advancing or not. Is, is, it, is, this um, right, is this the right slide? Is that the um, Trego one before? Yes. Yeah, the next slide. Perfect. Okay. Sorry, my Zoom sometimes freezes, so I may not have no um, seen anything. So, um, oh, actually, Dr. Uh, Brian, there's a question from uh, Tom. Um, I believe it, it pertains to the prior one. He asked, um, where, where would college, college kids land uh, uh, and also to include medical or nursing students? Yeah, so um, the, the medical and nursing students um, would be um, potentially within that stage 1A if they're being exposed to high-risk health workers. In terms of um, the general population though, because I know, you know part of our discussion is, well, you know, should you vaccine those that are most likely to spread it? I don't know if that's where Tom was um, maybe kind of heading heading into with that question. Um, again, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge with this partition part, but they would probably be in that stage three young adult for kind of just typical college students. Perfect. Um, and then, um, uh, well, Tom, if you have any other questions, we, we can address at the end of the presentation too. Thank you. And then this, um, next slide. So, um, so I know um, I think it was Andrew that earlier asked about you know um, help you know where, where, where are we going to kind of get the data to kind of make the um, vaccination logistic planning. So um, there um, is a lot of outreach to throughout the community. So regarding high risk health workers and um, I was I was approved to share this information, but I. I I was um, asked to preface this by this, these, this data here is still being vetted. Um, so um, um, this is some of the data that we're kind of getting through the healthcare system, but we're still kind of working on specifics for it. So you can kind of see our, our, our estimated population for this. And, and some of this is based on an assumption that, you know, not 100% of healthcare workers are actually going to agree to get it. So um, I believe these numbers are kind of based on a 70% assumption of uptake. Um, next slide. And um, the next data, um, uh, much mahalo to um, Hawaii Health Data Warehouse. 
And if you're not aware of that, um, they they do um, keep a lot of our different um, state surveys that go out there looking at different aspects of our population. Um, next slide. So, um, you know, um, so, so a lot of this does come from a different population-based surveys out there. Um, so this is kind of different ethnic populations by county. And again, um, do not um, take this um, um, as a final number because again, it's still being vetted. But just to kind of give you a taste that um, we are capturing the data as best as possible for this. And I don't know if you want me to pause here if anyone wants to um, peruse this a little bit. Uh, I'll defer to Thomas if he wants to advance the next slide or not. Any questions on this particular one? I know that, um, especially in Hawaii, we, you know, this is a note from, from my public health background. So I know uh, there's a lot of disparities um, that we've noticed so far. Um, so I'm glad that uh, there, there's a lot of effort looking at, um, at breaking it down by, by this demographic. So. And then um, this one is kind of looking at those um, kind of more clear risk factors identified. So age, comorbid condition. So um, again, um, and, and the ideal is to kind of do it by county because that really helps with logistics planning for it. Um, so I will again, pause if there's any questions. Brian, we have a question from um... Uh, Marguerite, she's asking, are vaccinations not recommended for those over 80? Yeah, so um, the specific questions regarding the um, vaccine, the difficult part is um, the phase three data, which is really going to help with answering some of those questions, aren't publicly available just yet. I know that um, Pfizer, um, um, I guess, um, Folks that are involved with the logistics planning could potentially make a specific ask for them to provide a little bit more data. So um, can't answer a lot of questions. And that's the hard part with logistics planning is we're, we're trying to do logistics planning without the full information. So it is a bit of a moving target. So sorry, yeah, can't. Can necessarily answer that. And, but the 80 over here is just really kind of breaking down because we know that there's an exponential increase risk for um, morbidity, mortality, um, especially at the higher ages. So that's just giving a little bit more granular detail for that. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, and then we have a question from, uh, from, from Dr. Berryman. Uh, I don't know if you can see the Q&A, but I'll read it out for yeah. everybody. So uh, I see African American, uh, American Indian and Alaska Native as a priority group. Our disparities have been most marked among specific islanders. Is this group likely to be prioritized in Hawaii? So um, that the, the, da the data that I'm showing you isn't necessarily priority group. The priority group is going to be in that um, initial stage uh, or initial table I showed. So this is just kind of demographic data trying to break it down. But in, in terms of um, identifying groups that potentially may be in the party, there's um, kind of active discussions regarding that in the party slash allocation working group. Um, so um, uh, 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 another question is um, asking like folks that have anything to do with healthcare, would you take the vaccine? And then um, if you can push a next. Button. Next. So again, everybody's saying, show me the data, right? So I know there's a lot of questions out there. Um, I can go over what data is available in the New England Journal. And it's amazing. It's so great. Um, a lot of um, medical literature is now free regarding COVID. So the phase one data for Moderna and Pfizer is, um, is published in the New England Journal. You can kind of look that up. Um, I, I can provide what I know about that. Um, some caveats to it, though, especially regarding different vaccinations is, um, you know, certain subgroups like Pfizer, because it's an mRNA-based vaccine, they actually did include some folks with autoimmune diseases and mild immunodeficiencies, but um, 
the other ones where it's not RNA, um, they, they would have to exclude them because you wouldn't want to give like a, a, a viral vector vaccine to somebody with an immune deficiency because, you know, even though it's supposed to be safe, if your immune system is compromised, it could be unsafe. So there's so many, so many different um, caveats to all of this. Um, but, um, you know, the other thing is, the, uh, and I can't remember their acronym, but there is a, a vaccine advisory working group nationally that will be, um, so it's supposed to be separate from pharmaceutical industry that's going to vet all of this data and then make their recommendations known nationally. So a lot of um, different states are, you know, obviously going to look upon their expertise because they'll have access to more of the granular details in that, that may not be publicly available for it. And one other quick thing is I know um, Thomas mentioned that efficacy. So that efficacy data that you're seeing is based on case events. So when they said 95%, what they meant for the Pfizer one is, I think um, in the treatment arm, nine out of their, I think they have what, 44,000 um, folks in their phase three. So nine folks that got the vaccine um, got COVID, while 180 or something that got the placebo um, got COVID. So what they mean by efficacy for this isn't necessarily their immune response, but it's actually case events. But as you can imagine, you know, um, the longer we have more data, the more we'll know um, how real effective it is. Because things like when they made the rotavirus vaccine, when they actually administer to different populations, you know, um, um, parts of the world that um, did not have as much um, of medical resources, their efficacy of the vaccine was not the same as kind of um, industrialized countries. So there's so much still unknowns for this. Um, but um, next slide. Yeah, uh, thanks, David. Um, ACIP. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, I think Pfizer, um, according to um, Dr. Gupta on CNN, um, he said Friday Pfizer was going to submit, but I don't know how true that is. But Moderna is right around the corner for that. And in terms of safety efficacy, so for Project Warp Speed, well, actually for EUA, um, these companies had to have at least half of their subjects observed for two months after the, their last dose, because they needed the safety data for at least two months. So that's why they're waiting this period before they submit for EUA. Um, next slide. And then, um, Regarding logistics, ultra code, this is my reminder to talk about logistics and ultra, you know, um, code refrigeration and all of those aspects. Um, um, happy, I know there's probably a host of questions and I, I know um, Dr. Hankins is on here and there's other folks on here as well. Um, happy to address any questions. Hey, Brian, we have one more question. Uh, this one from Lee. Uh, are there any vaccines that rely on muscle cell expression of the focal antigen? That seems like the weirdest part of the mRNA vaccines, which I understand are intramuscular. Yes, yeah, so, so it is intramuscular, but then it's going to be systemic circulation um, for it, which should be. Great, thanks. That helped that, that me. I mean, any of this. <laughs> you're, you're more of an expert than I am. Um, do you need me to advance to the next slide? I don't That's know. all uh, I got. Oh, oh, awesome. Oh, there's one more question from Yosh, and then uh, I'll, I'll make that our last question for the afternoon. Uh, Yosh is asking any idea or any idea of the typical efficacy of a flu vaccine? Great question. So the flu is a little bit different because, um, you know, the, the, so far, Thankfully, it seems like the targets for the COVID vaccine, um, those parts are a little bit more conserved. So even though there's mutations in the area, thus far, it's not changing it so much that the vaccine, the way that they create these vaccines wouldn't necessarily work. The flu, um, it, it mutates pretty regularly. So the efficacy varies. Um, I think in general, it's roughly around like 20 to like 66% or so, depending on the year and if they've guessed right. Um, on the vaccine for that year. Yeah, I think I, I would agree. I think back, you know, flu is a little different in terms of 
there's way more strains that they're trying to guess and, and they typically for the quadrivalent they, they try to find the four most prevalent for and they, they're guessing a year out so that's it's a it's a pretty big guess as well so um yeah tom yeah i'm tom you you wrote about 40 percent. i i'm not sure i haven't had a chance to delve too much into the flu at least for the flu vaccine part um but I can, I, I, can, I can take a look at that as well. Um, we have about a, a few more minutes left. I wanna say thank you to, to Dr. Wu and everybody for the participation um, today. And once again, this is our second week of our, of our new webinar format. Uh, always well, happy to, to take comments and feedback. You know, we're always here to, uh, to serve the community and the state. Um, so please email us, hi Pam. Uh, the email is on our on our website uh, and with that please uh, we will not be having uh, our meeting next week Thursday um, due to Thanksgiving so please have a very safe and happy Thanksgiving with your family. Um, Victoria uh, uh, added flu vaccine is usually based on seasonal variations based between hemispheres. Northern hemisphere uh, I believe is typically informed by southern hemisphere strains. Definitely great tidbit and great point. Thanks Victoria. Um, but uh, we're, we're taking a week off to, to, to decompress a little bit, spend some time with family. So please do the same. Stay safe. We will see you guys. Uh, let me just double check the date. We will see you guys on December 3rd. So this is our last November meeting. We will see you in December. Thank you so much, everybody.